A blind woman had heard it for years, but then her sister-in-law saw a sinister shape on the floor. Josette Batchman makes her way into her sister-in-law Rita Wolfenson's home, and she is shocked by what greets her there. The stench of decaying food mixes with the piles of trash strewn about the place. Even that assault on the senses couldn't have prepared Batchman for what she happened upon in the midst of the mess. A strange outline on a mattress raises alarm bells and later places the family in the midst of a mystery that could be criminal. At first, Batchman's visit to Wolfinson's home was completely innocent. The latter had ended up in the hospital, so her sister-in-law visited her home to gather some of her personal effects. It wasn't necessarily a secret that Wolfinson had a hoarding problem. The compulsion led her to fill her home with so much trash that it looked like a landfill. On top of that, Wolfenson suffered from blindness, so she couldn't discern all that hid among her piles. It would take Batchman's fateful visit in 2016 to reveal a shocking possibility about the woman who lived inside of the two-story home in Brooklyn. She may have hidden something more than just trash. Wolfenson's home in Brooklyn, New York's Midwood neighborhood, might have seemed a delic from the outside. The two-story brick house had all the trappings of a traditional American abode, and it had a whooping $700,000 property value in 2016. However, behind the home's classic facade, tragedy had altered Wolfenson and her family. In 1987, Wolfenson's husband, Jess, had passed away, leaving her to raise their two sons, Michael and Lewis. Nearly a quarter century later, the family lost another member. Elder brother Michael died in 2003 at just 38 years old. Unfortunately, he wouldn't be the last to disappear from Wolfenson's life either. According to relatives, no one had seen Wolfenson's younger son, Lewis, since 1996. On that note, many of Wolfenson's relatives noted that their relationship with her had grown distant as time went by. Her brother, Joseph Butchman, told newspaper The New York Post that he hadn't been close to Wolfenson for years. Still, Joseph and his wife, Josette, stepped in to help Wolfenson when she landed in an assisted living facility on Long Island. It was Josette who trekked to the widow's Brooklyn home to gather some of her belongings and bring them to the hospital. Once she had entered the house, Butchman realized the extent of Wolfenson's hoarding problem. Hoarders tend to find it nearly impossible to let go of their things, even if those items have no value. Those who suffer from the disorder tend to squirrel away magazines, newspapers, cardboard boxes, clothes, plastic bags, household cleaners and supplies, photographs and more. On top of that, some hoarders shop compulsively or take home and store every free item they can. Hoarding symptoms stretch far beyond the collection of a mass amount of stuff. Those with the disorder may seem incredibly anxious when it comes time to throw things away or organize them. They might worry if they think that they are running low on something. Or they might get angry if someone touches the things they have stocked up over the years. There are multiple reasons why such a compulsion plagues people. For one thing, they believe that they are gathering possessions that they can use in the future. They imagine that their belongings will be valuable in the future. Or hoarders see their collections as sentimental, invaluable or too great of a discount to discard. Some hoarders use their collections as a memory bank. They worry that if they throw an item away, they will no longer be able to remember special moments or people. And then there are those who can't figure out where to put their wares. Rather than discarding the piled up supplies, they decide to keep everything instead. Those who hoard may have other afflictions that encourage their behavior. For instance, obsessive compulsive disorder can cause a person to begin hoarding. That's typically the case if a person collects items because they fear contamination or because they have superstitious thoughts. 
OCD might also be the case if a person becomes fixated on collecting many versions of a single object. Hoarding could also have its roots in attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, obsessive-compulsive personality disorder, depression or brother willy syndrome. A genetic condition can cause a spiritual hunger, behavioral issues and intellectual impairment. Hoarding tendencies also appear in those who have eating disorders, people who eat non-food materials or patients suffering from dementia or psychosis. Interestingly, nearly half of all hoarders don't see their compulsion as a problem, while most of their family and friends, on the other hand, do view hoarding that way. With the right intervention, therapy and medication, though, a quarter of hoarding patients can overcome their compulsion to pile up things that they do or don't need. Until then, though, most hoarders live amid conditions that are dysfunctional, unsafe and unsanitary. For instance, many will live without heat or functioning appliances because they don't want to let a repairman or woman into their homes. Piles can make it hard to move around and some of the gathered goods can facilitate devastating house fires too. In Wolfinson's case, she not only dealt with hoarding, but she was also legally blind. It's slightly different for a person to be blind in the eyes of the law, as opposed to completely blind. Those in the former category have such poor vision that contacts or glasses can't sharpen their sight to a specific benchmark. In the United States, a person will be deemed legally blind based on two factors their visual acuity, or their ability to see what's in front of them, and their field of vision, which includes everything over, under and to the sides of their central viewing area. If a person's wearing contacts and their central visual acuity measures at 2200 or lower, then they are legally blind. A person will also fall into the legally blind category if their field of vision is smaller than 20 degrees. In the U.S., many people suffer from low vision, which means they see at 20, 40 or worse. Even with corrective lenses, as of 2015, one million Americans fell into the category of legal blindness. In Wolfinson's case, her hoarding and blindness combined to transform her Brooklyn home into an absolute mess. Police officers told the New York Post in 2016 that some spaces in the widow's home looked like a garbage truck had dumped its load inside. Wolfinson's sister-in-law Butchman got to experience it herself when she visited the home in 2016. When she walked in, she was met with the smell of decaying food left behind by the widowed mother of two. Trash and debris littered the property. Making Butchman's job of gathering Wolfinson's hospital must have all the more difficult. But Butchman's search took a very dark turn when she entered a second floor bedroom, a room that the Post described as debris shocked. Even with all Wolfinson's things clogging the space, her sister in law still noticed something scary a strange outline on a mattress contained within the sleeping quarters. Upon closer inspection, Butchman realized that she hadn't just stumbled upon a strange figure on the bed. She understood that she was looking at a skeleton still dressed in the last outfit it wore while alive. Jeans, a shirt and even socks still bedecked the bony frame. The person seemed to have died on the bed while lying on his back. As though that wasn't upsetting enough, things got even scarier when investigators identified whose body laid on the mattress in Wolfinson's cluttered home. They revealed that the body belonged to the widow's youngest son, Louis, the one who had disappeared two decades before the grisly discovery. One law enforcement officer likened the scene to one of Alfred Hitchcock's most famous films. He said, it's like some reverse psycho scene. In that film, lead character Norman Bates stores his mother's remains in the basement. Upon further inspection, though, Wolfenson's situation might not have been as sinister as the one in the classic horror flick. 
Although Wolfenson's home had wafted the scent of spoiled food, it hadn't had the signature smell of decaying human flesh, investigators said. Also, they said that the bedroom had been filled to the brim with the homeowner's hoarded garbage and clutter. So they concluded that Wolfenson probably had had no idea her son's body had been there. An interview with Wolfenson further corroborated this theory. Investigators asked the holder about Lewis. She spoke about her son as if he had moved out of her home decades ago. Consequently, it seemed that she had no clue that his body had been lying on her spare mattress either. Perhaps because she had grown apart from them, many of Wolfenson's relatives refused to provide details about the case. One told the Post that they'd have to wait until after the funeral to learn more about the body. Investigators didn't identify the body as Lewis outright, but they did confirm that they thought the skeleton belonged to the widow's son. As it turns out, Wolfenson wouldn't be the first person to live alongside a dead person for months or years after they perished. In 2014, Timothy Brown's neighbor stopped by his house to check on the then 59-year-old and his non agenarian father, Kenneth. As they peered into the house, though, they saw something stunning. At first glance, it may have seemed like Kenneth sat in his favorite armchair by the fireplace of the home he shared with his son. However, the neighbor realized that the pajama-wearing figure reclined in the seat was actually Kenneth's dead body. Timothy sat nearby and watched TV with his father's skeletal remains. An inquest into Kenneth's death revealed that he had fallen the day before died. The next day, Timothy found his father's body, but he didn't call the police. Instead, he placed his father's remains into his chair and continued to live alongside him for up to four months before the neighbor dropped in. Neighbors in Buenos Aires, Argentina, apartment block shed light on another macabre living situation. In December 2013, they had begun to notice a terrible smell wafting from then 58-year-old Claudio Alfari's unit. They called in the authorities, who burst into the property at the start of January 2014. Inside, policemen and firefighters discovered Alfari's body slumped over a chair. They calculated that the almost 60 years old had been dead for approximately 30 days. Yet the discovery of his body wasn't the most chilling aspect of the scene. Authorities found a second corpse sitting beside him. That body had been wrapped in plastic bags to preserve it, but still had on the slippers it had worn during its life. Upon further inspection, authorities revealed that the corpse belonged to Alfari's mother, Margarita Amer de Alfari. Neighbors also confirmed the body's identity, in spite of the fact that they hadn't seen the woman for a decade. During that time, Alfari told concerned neighbors that his mother had been just fine, but investigators believed that her death had caused him to suffer a psychological breakdown, which combined with his own obsessive-compulsive disorder. Perhaps those conditions led him to effectively mummify his mother's body. Or, authorities said at the time, Alfari might have hidden his mother's death due to a dispute over his inheritance. Either way, his preservation tactics worked to keep his mother's body in good condition until police found her. According to UK newspaper The Daily Mail, one officer said, the old lady's body was covered in bags and plastic and she still had her winter slippers on. In Alfari's case, though, he didn't seem to have a hand in his mother's death, which authorities believed to have happened between 8 and 10 years before the discovery of her body. Instead, both she and her son died of natural causes, and he took care of her until the end. The officer described it looked like she had been covered up lovingly. Of course, these stories differ from Wolfenson's because, in both cases, the family knew that their loved one had passed away. The widow had already lost her husband and her eldest son, Michael. She seemed to believe that her youngest son was still alive, although he hadn't been seen for such a long time. 
In the end, investigators estimated that Lewis had passed away up to 20 years prior to the discovery of his body. Nothing about his passing was out of the ordinary, though, aside from the strange garbage riddled grave where he rested, authorities announced that they believed that he had died by natural causes. As for Walfinson, her beautiful Brooklyn brick home had fallen into disrepair by the time that her sister-in-law, Josette, discovered Lois' body. A reporter from the New York Post revealed that the property appeared empty in September 2016, and the widow's mail had begun to pile up. Of course, at that time, Walfenson had been checked into a hospital. Her ailments precipitated Butchman's visit to the property. Neither Butchman nor her husband, Joseph, would reveal Walfenson's location after the discovery of Lewis's body. However, the Post said that it had seen the couple live in a Long Island assisted living facility, where the legally blind hoarder might have ended up after her story hit the papers.